The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel. I am the host for this podcast, and today is episode number 205. We are very close to the end of our fourth year of weekly podcasting, and I would like to say thank you so much for listening. When a person is addicted to drugs and or alcohol, the myriad of choices of treatment can be overwhelming. Narconon Ojai is a residential treatment facility that addresses the physical, mental, and spiritual aspects of addiction with a proven, evidence-based, drug-free, holistic, step-by-step program designed to free those trapped by addiction. For more information, call 1-866-231-5924. Before I talk to you about the person we're going to interview this week, I wanted to just give a little bit of a shout out. We have a gentleman who advertises with us, and if you listen to our podcast all the way through, in the middle, you will hear me give a paid advertisement for Bobby Newman. Bobby Newman is an interventionist. He has a newsletter that he has been sending out, and the one that I got recently I thought was so interesting, I wanted to share a little bit with you about what he wrote. He talked about the three myths of getting someone into treatment. And the first one is that intervention is not necessary because an addict can stop on their own. And he points out that that's not necessarily true. And I think that this is something we think sometimes like, why can't he or she just stop taking the drug? Well, because they're addicted physically, emotionally, and spiritually and mentally. So intervention is often necessary. The second myth, he says, is that someone addicted to drugs will seek out help on their own. While this may happen in a few cases, and while for sure we've talked to addicts who had a very low point and thought, wow, I really need some help, but then they don't get it right at that time, it's not something you want to wait for. Um, You know, you're plan should be to get somebody into treatment just as soon as you possibly can. So don't wait. They may not seek out help on their own. And then the last myth he mentioned was that an addict must hit rock bottom before they accept help. Well, while I can sort of see the logic in that, sometimes rock bottom is an overdose and death. So your question would be, do you want to wait until your loved one um, has a horrible overdose or dies or goes to prison? before you get help. So these were from Bobby Newman. Bobby Newman is an interventionist. He um, has a website, newmaninterventions.com, and you can always call him and talk to him, and he'll give you advice and, and help you as much as he can. So much for my little commercial there. I just felt it was important because his newsletters have a lot of really valuable information that I think you need to know. So today we're going to be talking to a lady named Julie Weintraub, and I do want to make a little editorial comment that if you typically don't watch our YouTube videos, you only listen to the podcast, while you will hear in the podcast what a lovely lady Julie is, she's beautiful. I mean, really beautiful. So you might want to check out the video on this one. Julie Weintraub is originally from England and moved here in 1978 with her family. Her mother is English and her father East Indian. Experiencing firsthand what it is like to go through times of hardship and struggles, Julie has always made time to help those less fortunate around her. Julie was raised in a home with parents that always gave back and helped others in need. Her mother even moved a man who was homeless into their home and rehabilitated him until he became a homeowner himself. Residing in Florida since 1987, Julie has had a long history in our area, that would be the Pinellas County area, or the Tampa Bay area, of philanthropy and entrepreneurship. Currently, Julie is president of one of the most successful family-owned jewelry companies in the Southeast, Gold and Diamond Source, with her husband, Steve. 
In 2010, Julie founded Julie Weintraub's Hands Across the Bay, which has quickly become one of our area's most notable and respected charitable organizations, helping countless families in need. Without further ado, let's hear from Julie and have her tell us her story. Mm -hmm. Julie Weintraub, thank you so much for being willing to talk to us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. You, you are such a local rock star. I know when we talked before, you'd kind of go like, oh, I'm not a star, but you are. You really, no. are, you, you really are a local rock star, and we'll, we'll get into why that is. But tell us a little bit about your background that led you kind of up to where you are now. Um, well, we started Hands Across the Bay about 12 years ago, but um, I've always done charitable work, depending on whatever business that I had. Um, my father was an entrepreneur, so I know what it's like to have everything, and I know what it's like to have nothing. And, um, you know, so having that unique experience, you really have a lot more empathy for um, folks who are in a bad position to no fault of their own and know how important it is to be able to have that opportunity to have a hands um, up. So that's kind of what we do at Hands Across the Bay. Um, but we're most known for our work in domestic violence prevention and awareness programs. And I advocate for uh, attempted murder victims in courtrooms um, across the United States for um, the swiftest, uh, you know, strictest punishment for um, the abusers. And I've advocated on some murder cases as well. Awesome. Julie, you, you mentioned that your, um, your parents um, kind of taught you, I think I read it in your bio, and you also mentioned that your yeah. parents kind of believed in giving back. Would you share the story about your mom in the home yes. the sky? Oh, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of stories of my, my uh, family and my parents giving back. They're, they're both wonderful people. But um, yes, that particular story, um, we had lived in a small New England town uh, called Cohasset. And there was the guy that all the kids were afraid of. He was the guy that walked around with a grocery cart and they all called him Foxy. And some people just thought he was funny and other kids thought he was like really scary. And he would go and leave um, trash or various different items on people's doorsteps. And he was just kind of like, they called him, I, I, I hate the term, like the town bum, or he was just like Foxy, the crazy guy who was in the town. And um, my mom took interest, you know, in him to figure out like what is going on with him. He was always very nice. I would leave like milk cartons empty at our door. And we know it was meant to be a gift. And um, she took interest in him and actually ended up moving him into our house. <laughs> Amazing. And it turned out that he was just a um, survivor uh, with PTSD. He was on Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. And wow. the man was actually very wealthy. And he lived in a very expensive New England home in that town of Cohasset. And uh, we, I remember going to his house and there was like wall to, you know, from floor to ceiling of newspaper articles and things like that. Clearly he was struggling um, with uh, some mental disorders um, and he had estate managers. He had quite an estate that was just being handled. They didn't really care where he was and they were just paying themselves and it was really a, a bad uh, situation. And um, so I remember there was a little kitty cat that was running around his house. I ended up taking, adopting the cat and <laughs> we took him into our home. And my mom got him counseling and um, some therapy and everything like that. And it was really amazing to see because where everyone was like, oh my gosh, Mrs. Vance, what has your mother done? And uh, it turned out he did very, very well and ended up um, becoming a homeowner. He bought his own home. He got married and lived the rest of his life as um, a member of the community, um, not as someone who was walking around as a town weirdo. And um, I saw firsthand what an incredible difference just taking that interest and a little bit of time and understanding did for his life. And wow. um, so that was that's such a, a really that's just a great experience. story. I, I love that story. I would I, I would like to meet your mom sometime because it's just it's such a great story. So yeah. you started Hands Across the Bay. Um, tell us why you started it, and then I'll kind of move it over into the subject of the podcast. Um, well, um, years ago, it, both things happened at about the same time. We had a uh, a guy here locally that um, committed suicide by cop 
Um, and it was a really sad case. I remember seeing it, it broke my heart. And the two children he had, there were two children in the home at the time. And they were the exact same age as my two kids. And um, I was like, why, why did he do this? Why did he do it? And he did it because he was struggling financially and his power got shut off. And he had the two kids at home and he was just humiliated probably and very stressed out. And now he had no power. And I thought, how could that possibly happen? I'm like, for his power bill, it's what any one of us could have spent on a dinner the night before or, right. you know, something else. And certainly I'm like, oh God, I would have paid his power bill. Like anyone would have paid his power bill. I would think this many people. And I looked into the programs and services that were around that were supposed to help folks with that. And I saw a lot of um, misallocation of funds. It wasn't really responsibly done. Um, and, you know, they would give the money to these certain organizations that were supposed to help people pay their power bill, but nobody was overseeing those organizations. And a lot of times you would call some of those organizations that got hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding, some of them over a million. And um, there was no one to answer the phone. There was no answering machine. And if you tried to call to get the assistance, you would see how difficult it really was. And some of them also just take that a bulk of funding and they just give it to anybody with no check. So anyone that calls, you get money, you get money, you get money until it's gone. But it could be the eighth or the 10th of the month. They just spent the money and then the rest of the month they spend, I'm sorry, we're out of funding right now. I'm sorry, we're out of funding right now. So they don't have to process any of those cases. It just wow. didn't make sense. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, uh, and at the same time we had a, um, young lady who was attacked by her abuser. She was leaving her abusive husband and she was, uh, he ambushed her and uh, hit her in the head with a hammer and poured gasoline on her and set her on fire. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was trying to help with that case, I also realized there was very little um, help for some of the immediate basic needs. There were some great organizations in our community. Certainly there are, um, but there each one help with this particular thing or this particular thing and this, and you know you can't get help with this if you don't have that. You really needed to be able to help make sure that person has a vehicle to go in when they get out and they have a, a house to go to and what have you. So we decided to open hands across the bay. I thought, I just wanna put whatever money I'm able to, to raise or if our God you know, hopes our business still does well, whatever money we're able to put aside that we can effectively um, help folks that are in a bad situation to no fault of their own. So we don't just blow through funding or whatever donations we get. We really look and see, is this someone that's just like habitually unemployed and partying and dialing for dollars? Or is it a family who has just run into some hard times and we can help stabilize that family with the funding. And if you care enough, you can make sure those dollars go to help save families and not enable people that really probably should be pushed to make sure that they, you know, get back to work and, and do what they're supposed to be doing. So um, that's why we open hands across the bay to keep it transparent and make sure that the dollars we get in go right out to families in need. Not, none go into my pocket or anybody else's pocket. They're all going to make sure that um, we can help people avoid those kind of situations. I, I think I think that's huge. I think it's so commendable what you're doing, and I know there are there's way more than that. We could spend just like probably three or four hours talking about all of the stories that you've encountered, but yes. I wanted to make sure that our listeners know that the reason why I wanted Julie to come on the podcast today and to talk to you is because so much of what she deals with in helping victims of abuse the the abuser is abusing drugs as yeah. well as the the victim and i there's there's a connection there and give it like the one you told us about the the woman yes. who was set on fire didn't you tell me that he was on drugs as well there's an almost every case that we have handled there is some if and, and you know in the statistics i found this interesting you know we talk about addiction and the relation between drugs and alcohol and abuse. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you guys chose to have me on because they're, they're, they're so entwined almost in every case. In the um, statistics here, they said 40 to 60% of um, all domestic violence cases. That is a, a false figure. I am telling you from doing this for 12 years, it's got to be at the very least 
80 to 90 percent, if not 95 percent, or could even be 100 percent. If it's not a legal drug uh, abuse and alcohol abuse, it's prescription. All of those are related in almost every single case that we have handled. And, um, you know, people are not in their right mind when they're doing that. And we find that um, drug and alcohol abuse um, is such an agitating factor to an already abusive or domestic violence situation. And um, I really think that it's something we all need to start talking about. You know, I, I think you make a very, very good point. And one of the things I had thought of um, before we spoke today yeah. was that, you know, if 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 there are people listening and maybe you could maybe you could talk a little bit about the signs of domestic abuse. But when there's a signs of domestic abuse, checking for addiction, I think, would be a valid thing to check for. Absolutely. There's a lot of red flags. I did this speech. It was in India, actually. And um I had, I think it was seven different signs. It's like a 12 minute piece. I'd love to send it to you, maybe play it for your viewer sometime. But we talk about the red flags um, that you certainly shouldn't uh, run past. But one of the red flags is abuse of drugs or alcohol. Listen, any of those things affect us all differently. Two different people can take the same medication or drink a glass of wine and get completely different results. So what we tell people is if you drink a glass of wine and you become funny and you're having a great time, great. But if you drink a glass of wine and you start slurring and become abusive um, or you're crying or you're angry or you're violent or whatever alcohol you're consuming is causing a bad effect and you spend the rest of that evening or the next day uh, apologizing, you need to put it down. It's really not that difficult. If it's not a blessing to your life, why do you keep picking it up and drinking it? You've, it? It's something that you've got to recover from and learn to live a sober life if it's not a blessing to you. Um, and I think some people seem to do okay with it, but um, we all know that um, addiction is a real thing. Um, my husband's been sober for 20, um, God, probably 24 years now. And um, not having that in our lives is a blessing. I don't, uh, I'm not afflicted with the uh, addiction. Um, but I could take alcohol or leave it. I'd rather uh, go without it. I like to know I'm a little bit of a control freak, I think. I like to know what's going on all around me. I'm too uptight to like sit back and, and, and get you know uh, drunk because I like to know what I'm saying or where I am and what's going on. Um, but uh, if it's not a blessing to you, you need to leave it alone. And also if you're mixing a tumultuous relationship and then you're bringing in um, drugs or alcohol, you are asking for trouble. Someone's going to end up in prison or dead. And it's yep. going to happen um, if you continue to have that in your life. You're right. Julie, were you were you married to Steve at the time? when he? Um, I then? knew him for nine years before when he was still drinking, but we were okay. not married at the time. Okay. Um, I was married to my uh, previous husband and um, he also actually had um, an issue with drinking. We're in the restaurant business and um, he gave that up and decided to become sober. So I've had um, a lot of experience and my life has been affected in um, very profound ways um, because of alcohol and addiction. And that's probably one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of it. From a young age, I always had to be very responsible um, because people around me were drinking and, and, and I always had to make sure we got home. And my friends always make fun of me that, you know, we're in our twenties, I would be reaching, reaching for a juice box and they were all drinking and having fun and how uptight it was. Well, I was uptight because my husband at the time, he loved to, to drink and he would, you know, he couldn't drive and he would, you know, completely overdo it to the point of um, passing out. So I had to like try and get us in the house without the neighbor seeing it was just wasn't a fun experience so uh thankfully he has no issues with that now we're still very good friends and he um is uh works here at the store with us we have a great relationship wonderful father and all of that but having that experience from a young age and having to be responsible um you know it it it, it impacted me tremendously um and i think that's one of the things i liked about steve is that he was a re in recovery Mm -hmm. um, and living a sober life because I didn't want to have to deal with anyone who was going out and getting wasted. Like I couldn't even like, I couldn't even think about 
dealing with somebody um, like that. So I'm, I have a lot of respect for uh, people who um, decide just to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. And, yeah. and uh, my kids are 20 and 21 and they've already kind of decided I'm not really going to have much to do with alcohol. They are like, it's both of them said, you know, we've drank and it was always a very bad experience. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my daughter has a line like it there. She just got engaged and she had um, Shirley Temples to do the cheer. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I find most of the people I surround myself with now either are in recovery or they don't drink um, at all. Um, but I don't know if I answered your question or you, not. You did but, answer my question. You but, did answer my question. And um, you are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out, if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name. Or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com or Call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I dot org or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. The service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. One of the, I wanted to just make a comment I, you know, bringing it back again to alcohol and, you know, how alcohol can be either a precursor to domestic abuse or a factor in domestic abuse. We interviewed a mom recently and um, unfortunately she lost her son to addiction ultimately. But I, you made me think of it because I remember her saying that he became so verbally abusive to her and you know, cussing her out and telling her how horrible she was. And that's the drugs. That wasn't her son that, you know, she had raised and who had loved her and had been friends with her because she shared a photo of the two of them together. And obviously they were very, very close. But the drugs caused him to be very aggressive and very abusive toward her. And anyway, you made me think of it because I, I wonder sometimes how much of the domestic abuse is there before the drugs and alcohol or if it just comes after the drugs and alcohol because so often you hear that you know girl meets boy they're very happy together and then they're not and it turns ugly and I I mean I I know there's mental illness but often I think that some of that is because all of a sudden someone is abusing drugs or alcohol on either side it could be that it's hard to tell. I think there's a certain kind of personality too that is more inclined to become addicted. Mm-hmm. So there's probably something going on before that, um, and I think it agitates it and makes it much worse. Um, any uh, error in judgment or or issues with anger or issues with making good choices and, and having the restraint to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that because that's not a good choice. Um, it's going to be 10 times worse when you, uh, when you put that in the mix. And 
you know, I try to tell people, and I, I kind of say that before holidays, because domestic violence goes through the roof, you know, and that, mm. you know, what is that? The mix of people are, this is a drinking holiday and everyone's going to get drunk. People ask me what I do on New Year's Eve. I'm like, I'm hiding from drunk people. <laughs> Aren't so, we all? I, Nobody's out on the road. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think we all are. So yeah. I think there, that relation is, is pretty profound. And I think that there is something there before, and I think it makes it worse because look, not everybody, um, is an addict. Not everybody who drinks is an alcoholic. Um, right. but some people are, and again, I have the utmost respect for people who choose to walk away from that. I think they're right. some of the coolest people that you can meet. And I feel like they're attached to a life raft that many don't get. Some people sink and they drown and they lose their lives. Like the woman you spoke to her son, you know, lost yeah. his life. Yep. Um, it causes the collateral damage to one addict is yep. profound. Yes. Um, and you have to, you have to, to know that, you know, that how many people you're going to hurt uh, when you get involved in that and indulge in that situation. Julie, can you share another story or two of someone sure. that you have helped whose um, abuser was, you know, yes. on drugs or alcohol? Um, I, I have so many different cases because again, mm -hmm. they've been involved in, in most every uh, case that we that we handle. One of the most uh, severe cases was the Mother's Day massacre case. I was the advocate on that case. Uh, that was a case that really almost ended my career in the courtroom because it was so horrific. I couldn't even share the details fully of um, what happened in that case. But when I was reading what happened, I in, in multiple cases, let me tell you about this one first, but I was, I couldn't believe that someone could actually do that. Like, how could somebody do that? Um, this uh, wonderful young lady who was a big animal lover and she had a horse, she had a dog, his name was Duke, a, a German shepherd. And um, she was a, a, a nice girl and she met a guy like many people do on Plenty of Fish. And um, she was only with him for six months and um, uh, right away, obviously, there started to be some concerns. They did a background check on him. And unfortunately, this is why it's important for everybody to do their job. He had a prior uh, arrest uh, and charges for mutilating cats. If that would have been there, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, that would be like a deal breaker for me if I'd known that. It would be a deal breaker. And <laughs> yeah. I can tell you right now that the family was a good family and they checked that out. And the, even the parents checked him out. So that would have been a deal breaker for them and their whole family would still be alive because someone didn't do their job and didn't enter in his charges into the system as they were supposed to like, oh, someone didn't enter it in. Are you kidding me? They like, didn't find out. I hate oh, to say God. it, but I hope whoever didn't end the, enter that in in Pasco County like knew that like they didn't enter the charge, whatever, wherever they were supposed to put it, they just didn't do it. They dropped the ball. How badly that can affect someone's uh, life. Uh, this guy was a previous corrections officer too in a um, uh, in a prison. So I obviously the guy was like a serial killer and really really bad bad news. Um, but they didn't have the warning they should have had even even with that prior record. And um, he was taking all kinds of antipsychotic drug medication, so prescribed drugs um, and alcohol. And he uh, the day that he murdered this uh, single mom and her two children and their family dog. He had also introduced now crack cocaine. Oh, so gee. drugs, alcohol, addiction, the whole thing. He couldn't, you know, he didn't want to uh, get past that. And he became so disturbed that he, again, killed the, the uh, little girl and the little boy and the mother and there was dismemberment and oh. you know and a neighbor heard the dog who was probably the german shepherd trying to protect the family or the children heard the dog yelping and a guy was a neighbor heard it and his uh uh answer was oh and they said well didn't you call the police you heard screaming or, or this happening he's like well i just thought she was mouthing off and you know he was you know taking care of it. Like he just thought that somebody was slapping around their wife uh, for good reason. And hearing that and saying something could have saved some of that family. It could have saved the children's lives or somebody else's life. And um, 
that's a very sad situation, but that was obviously drug induced to do yeah. what he did was so horrific. It haunts me to this day. I literally handled so many um, attempted murder cases or murder cases with really horrific details, people being set on fire, being shot in the head, being shot in the abdomen. I have multiple survivors who are missing eyes. I'm constantly trying to help people put together their lives physically and emotionally. Um, but that was drug induced. And, yep. um, yep. Uh, you know, and most of them are drug or alcohol or, 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 or you know, well, you know, and you bring up a really good point, Julie, because a lot of people think, well, it was a prescribed drug. Therefore, how could it be dangerous? But the side effects of an antipsychotic drug is psychosis. Yes. Just like the side effect of an antidepressant is suicide, the ultimate yes. in depression. And, you know, it, We've said this on the podcast so many times, like just because a doctor prescribes it doesn't mean that it's right. Yes. And you could take an antipsychotic and go, I don't like the way that makes me feel. I'm not going to take it anymore. I might take one and go and murder somebody because it's, yes. it, 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 uh, it's like playing Russian roulette. And that's such a horrific story. And uh, the people who made mistakes, it's like, I don't know how they live with that. I don't know how the next door neighbor lives with that. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean it's just... And then the other one where the, the young girl was, um, he shot her. He, she was trying to leave him again. It's only a short period of time. And the, she became pregnant, a young girl. He wanted her to have an abortion and she didn't want to have the abortion. So she said she wasn't going to, he started to pretend like the house was getting broken into. Um, and it wasn't, uh, he came home. I'm going to spare you a lot of the details, but he, it's no holds bar. You can tell us whatever. <laughs> She put her hands up to stop herself from being beaten again. This girl uh, is about four foot 10. She looks like she's about 12 years old. It would break your heart. Um, she put her hands up thinking he was going to start punching her again because he would beat her quite often or beat the dog to, a, you know, to hurt her. Guy was a sick guy on a lot of drugs, 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 drugs. And he took a gun and he shot um, her in the head. Uh, and her hand took the bullet. And so it stopped right before it got to her brain, but she lost her eye. Um, and when the police went and everything, um, the house was full of, of drugs that he had, various different drugs and everything. He didn't face any charges for those drugs. Um, obviously he was on drugs, the guys, everything was about drugs with the absence of drugs, would he have like come home and shot his girlfriend in the face? You'd have to think, hopefully not. Um, but in the case, that's why these numbers, as bad as they seem, I'm telling you, they're a lot higher. Nowhere in those statistics was that case related to abuse of drugs or alcohol. Was it drugs or alcohol? Abuse? Absolutely. Was a prerequisite right. to, to so many of these cases happening. And um, anyway, it's just uh, a, a really sad situation. And obviously, the, the, he had some issues. And before that was abuser. But again, him growing up in that situation and so on, uh, so forth is a, a big problem. Melissa, um, who runs our domestic violence awareness and uh, prevention programs, very well known. She's done a lot of, you know, stories with 2020, 48 hours, multiple different um, national uh, uh, organizations or news outlets and internationally speaking internationally. Um, her abusive um, ex was on a lot of antipsychotic medication as well. And uh, so when I'm sitting in the courtroom and hearing, like, you, you're just trying to, like, take in, like, how could you possibly do this over and over again? Why I was thankful that you took interest is that you always hear the list of medications yep. come yep. through of uh, the antipsychotic medications, the drugs, the alcohol, um, and even the, the contact case with the, the officer that was shot and, um, and run over, leaving that whole family here in our community that was devastating. The guy's drugs, all the list of drugs and medications he was. He like literally shot a police officer and then ran him over. Yep. You know, yep. the, the weight on our society is is tremendous. It, it is tremendous. And, you know, Julie, I'm going to get on my soapbox just for a minute. I'm not, um, I'm, I don't like to get political, but, you know, what happens when there's like a horrific 
murder like that or a school shooting is the attention goes on to the the guns and but i i don't abuse drugs and i can have a gun and i know how to use a gun and i'm going to be very responsible in how i use my gun but the minute you put and enter drugs and almost one for one when these shootings happen and as you're telling us today when these horrific crimes happen one for one the person is on drugs whether they're prescription drugs whether they were prescribed by a legitimate doctor doesn't matter that's what that's what can of, often flip the switch on a relatively normal individual and yeah. all bets are off and then you have to pick up the pieces with the victims of those crimes and it I, I yeah I mean, you're that's affirming it. The forty to sixty percent is kind of ridiculous because yeah, there's no, there's no way. There's absolutely no way they don't track it um, like they should at all. And and now you're introducing testosterone into the mix. Oh yeah, high well, doses of that. It's and very I think common. it doesn't. I think it doesn't get tracked, Julie, because I think that there is the concept. Well, if a doctor prescribed it, it must be okay. But why there is no you know, it's it's a mystery why someone doesn't look. I mean, let's just take the number of cases you've had. What would you estimate? How many people do you think you've helped in the last you know, 11 I hate, years? I, I hate to count. Um, I've handled, you know, countless cases, but the major cases, probably at least, I don't know, 15 to 17. I have multiple. Now when someone, you say to me, oh, Julie, the case you handled with the girl that was shot. I have to say, which one? Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, the girl that, that you handled and she was, she lost an eye. Which one? I have three three survivors who have no eye and I had to replace our prosthetic eye, like, or the, the survivor that had set on fire. I have to say which one. Yeah. I, the, the survivor that you have that was stabbed to death, almost stabbed to death. I have to say which one, how crazy is that? So, so many, but it's in all of, many. but in all of those, what percentage, so you've already said that at least 90 to 95%. I think, uh, oh, in the cases I have, I think it's probably close to 100%, but just to be conservative, I'm going to say 95%. Drugs I mean, or there, alcohol. There you go. And you're like on the front line, you're dealing with these people and you're seeing it. And uh, anyway. And one it's... thing that's not being, you know, uh, testosterone where people have low testosterone monitored, uh, that's totally fine. Um, but... I think that a lot of people who have no business uh, administering that are, and it's not being tested. And you know that when people taking high testosterone are very aggressive people, it's causing divorces, aggression, abuse, physical, emotional, uh, financial, anyway. And um, I would, they're not tracking it, but I would love to see how many people like really we're on high doses of testosterone. And I think you'd be shocked because that's one other thing we've added into it. And it's prescribed to women and men now as well. And, um, you know, if you look at suddenly, like, you know, years back, you started seeing an increasing thing where people were like road rage and people are jumping on people's windshields and getting so mad, they just <laughs> flip out. And I'm like, you think like people acting like crazy zombies and yeah. you think what could be suddenly causing people to behave that way? It could be a mixture of lack of upbringing or financial, you know, family stability and the breakdown of the family home. But I'm telling you, and I have no way of knowing, but I'm suspicious of that added drug that's being added into, uh, into society, women and men being, um, often prescribed testosterone again, in a civilized way that's being monitored. I'm sure it's fine, but so many people are taking it. Nobody's checking. Their testosterone is through the roof. And we know it can cause major aggression and lack of patience. Yep. Yep. I think you're absolutely right. Julie, I just appreciate so much what you're giving back to the community through your foundation. You. I know your husband's a part of that. You guys are very successful in your business. And I just, I really... I can't thank you enough for what you do. You you speak for the people who, you know, can't necessarily speak for themselves. And I think that that's huge. Well, yes, we, we, uh, I used to get really frustrated when people would say, oh, you're a celebrity. I'm like, I'm not a celebrity. I'm a business owner that does commercials. But finally I said, okay, if you're going to view me that way and put a camera in front of my face and give me a voice like you, you are now, um, 
I have something to say because the things I see are are unbelievable. The, the cases I've sat through um, in the courtroom and everything are will have a profound effect on me for the rest of my life. And if anyone's willing to listen to some of the things that I've learned um, from having that unique perspective to be in the courtroom and listen to all the facts of the case and then listen to what their upbringing was and what they were on at the time. Um, drugs and alcohol are definitely a major factor, contributing factor to major violence, attempted murder and murders in our country. It's an epidemic and it's an American epidemic. You hear the cases, you know, I have a girl that was set, you know, had um, boiling oil poured all over her and women set on fire. I'm not talking about cases in the Middle East. This yeah, is right yeah. here in the United States of America. It's an epidemic and we need to talk about it and we need to analyze what could be causing this. And there's one um, common denominator between them all, and that is drugs and alcohol. Thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I was thinking a lot about it because obviously Julie's charity is for um, victims of domestic abuse, and that's who she deals with. But we realized when we saw something that she had posted on Facebook that she also had quite a... Um, quite a concept on how drugs and alcohol feed into the whole domestic violence scene. And I thought it would be interesting for you to hear kind of a different take on what some of the effects of drugs and alcohol can be. We know that, you know, people who are addicted to drugs can oftentimes steal from beloved family members. As I say, we heard from a mom who's son became very verbally abusive to her. So it's not a far jump for your loved one if they're addicted to drugs and or alcohol to commit violent acts. And you need to be aware of it. And there's a connection there. And I think the other point to make here is that your loved one is not an abuser. They weren't born an abuser. And so what drugs and alcohol can make someone do is not them it's how they react under drugs and alcohol and i think unless we've been full-on addicts we don't necessarily know how bad that can get so thank you for listening we'll be back again next week with another interview you have been listening to the addiction podcast point of no return sponsored by narconon ojai for more information on Narcanon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcononojai.org. Narcanon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.